gone after him. Then he did the big arrests up in Appalachia of a lot of mob leaders. Very dramatic in the newspaper oh, yeah. surrounding the uh, retreat. Well, he, was, he thought that was going to make him president next time around, you know, after Jack. But it, uh, it backfired. So there was a conversation between Trafficanti, who was out of Chicago, and he was in charge of the mob in Tampa, Florida, and Marcello, who was the head of the mob in New Orleans, which also included the Havana, which by then was a hot subject. Casinos. Bob, Bobby uh, hated Marcello and just dropped him off in Guatemala in the, in the forest. It's in the book. It's quite fascinating. Marcello swore vengeance. Trafficani is talking to him. The conversation is being recorded. And uh, Trafficani says, we've got to get rid of Bobby. I mean, this, this is awful. You know, he's going to go after more and more and more of us and so on. And, Trafic and Marcello says, if a dog is bothering you, you don't cut off his tail. And that was the death sentence for poor Jack. Sure. And then, then the Kennedy brothers were arranging, this is after the missile crisis and the general promised to Khrushchev to lay off the Cubans. And Jack said, well, we will if he, he will allow us to inspect the missiles. Yeah, everyone, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but everyone forgets that. That, that um, everybody thinks Kennedy won that day. The fact is he caved. Because he gave Khrushchev a promise not to overthrow Castro, and after the failed Bay of Pigs, he had given the emigres or the exiles in Florida the promise that he would invade again. Yeah. And they were gearing up for another invasion, but because of the missile crisis, they called it, at least temporarily, called it off. Yes, they did. Ultimate Sacrifice is a book that's just out, and I highly recommend it. Uh, it describes how the Kennedy brothers were planning in 1963, December, to overthrow Castro on the grounds that he had not lived up to the agreement with Khrushchev, which was that we, we, Kennedy would not invade Cuba if he was allowed, we were allowed to check and see whether the, the missiles that were there were really there and so on. Castro didn't live up to that. Kennedy took this, okay, the brothers decided, now we'll, now we'll get Castro. What we didn't do at the Bay of Pigs, we'll do now. But it has to be done in total secrecy, because it can be a, a cause of war if Khrushchev finds out, because the Russians have proven that they, they, they can do us a lot of damage. And they've got a base against the United States and Cuba. So in the greatest of secrecy, the CIA was left out of it, because Jack always thought that they were the ones who had made, made the mess at the Bay of Pigs. So it was put under the Department of Defense, so it was, it was pretty much an army manure. Now the Kennedy, they, they called it Sea Day, which either Sea for Castro or Sea for Cuba. Then it was penetrated, now by then the Mafia, as I was explaining earlier, was very angry at Bobby Kennedy. And then they transferred their anger to his boss, the president. And three mafia godfathers decided to kill Jack. That was Carlos Marcello of New Orleans, and sometimes Havana. Santo Traficante of Tampa, Florida. And Johnny Roselli out of Chicago. And all three were being vigorously pursued by Attorney General Robert Kennedy along with a dozen of their associates, of whom six were also working on the Castro murder case. Now, there were three attempts made on Jack's life. The mob bosses, because they're Trafficantians, and Marcello was in charge of this, basically, targeted JFK twice before Dallas, once in Chicago on November 2nd. 63. J JFK called off his motorcade. Then in Tampa on November 18, he, he went through 
the parade, this motorcade that went on endlessly, and he knew that there was somebody out there with a gun. Exactly the same setup that they used at Dallas, which was his next stop. And the next stop, he was killed. So for a long time, everybody wondered in Washington, those of us who knew the Kennedys, Bobby, who was nothing if not vengeful, he was still Attorney General of the United States. LBJ had kept him in office. So the FBI is under him. He could have conducted a great investigation. Why didn't he? Who killed his brother? All this nonsense about Lee Harvey Oswald it was pretty hollow even then. And uh, he was afraid. First, the cover-up comes from Johnson. They, they don't want any trouble from the Russians, and they felt there might be trouble. So Bobby conducted really basically no investigation, and nobody else did either. Then he said to Bill Walton, a friend of mine, a friend of all of us in those days, and to a number of other people, and Bobby would find it toward the end of his career in Washington, he said he knew who was behind it. It was Marcello of New Orleans, mafia guy. But he couldn't say a word about it because the plot to kill Castro would be revealed to the whole world. And the Kennedys would be under a very dark cloud, even though there are people still mourning for poor Jack. And he would have no chance in politics. So there he is sitting with this knowledge. And that's why he was having all those crying jags that people report. He was just wandering around like a lost soul. He could do nothing about what he wanted to do, which was, you know, take care of Marcello. So nothing was done. And in time, the Castro uh, murder plot was not acted upon. And Castro survives to this day. It's interesting because there was an earlier murder plot um, before Kennedy to get Castro uh, that Nixon had something to do with. And Oliver Stone's theory in his movie Nixon is that uh, Watergate was blowback, the exposure of Watergate was, uh, and the, what Nixon was concerned about in the files was, was evidence. Um, that Hunt had and, uh, of the attempt to kill Castro and that that would be revealed and his role in it would be revealed. So the Castro has haunted our whole lives for what? A, a small little island with what was then six million people, must now be 11 or 12 million, no real resources. Uh, a lot of good doctors. Well, now, yeah, you know, uh, but, but I mean, the, the amazing thing about imperialism, I mean, it's a tangent, but it interests me, you know, it, it's, it's pursued for the oddest reasons. Either it's particular interests of a few companies that make out and the rest pay the taxes and sacrifice their young for it, as we have with Halliburton hmm. and places like the Whitley Well or the oil companies. Myself, so for the because of some misguided view of how you're going to change the world or help Israel or spread, you know, some. Uh, or well, sometimes it is just plain vanity. And I think it is vanity. The United States, the whole Vietnam thing is just a uh, vanity gone mad. How dare they stand up to us, these primitive little people? We are the first global empire on earth. We've got, we can blow them up ten times over. Well, vanity can do you in. Well, I think that's in there. I think that's what happened with Castro. Oh, no, no, he, he represented. Well, he said no. You know, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, who's he to say that? Oh, Jack was obsessed with it. I remember he told me, and he knew a young lady journalist uh, who'd had a, an affair with Castro. She'd also had one with him. And he got her to report on Castro, and she came back from Havana. You can probably figure out who she was. It's, she and I were involved politically at one moment. And uh, Jack said, you, 
you know, he, he has sex with his boots on. <laughs> he was amazed at that. That had never occurred to him anybody to do that. You know? <laughs> All right. Uh, but you liked Kennedy, right? I mean, Jack, no, very much. Yeah. I did not like Bobby, but I certainly liked Jack. What was the difference? Night and day. Jack used to say what people must remember, because people were always complaining to him, including me, about Bobby. That Bobby's a policeman. And if he hasn't arrested somebody that day, he goes home and arrests Rose. <laughs> His mother. <laughs> These uh, imitations are great. <laughs> All right, so now, before we read the chapter, I just wonder, this, this, I found this very moving at the end of your book, the Pope thing. I wonder if you'd be willing to read that, the poem. I mean, it's the end of the book. I wish I had more Kennedy imitations. Can you do LBJ, too? I used to be able to, yes. Uh, Professor Marcy Frank, She's a professor at the University of Toronto. Wrote a little book about my work. And she's flattered me by a comparison to Alexander Pope. So in ending, let me quote the last lines of Pope's Dunciad. Lines that I learned voluntarily as a schoolboy. Nor public flame, nor private dares to shine, nor human spark, nor human spark is left, nor blip, nor public flame, nor private dares to shine, nor human spark is left, nor glimpse divine. Lo, thy dread empire, chaos, is restored. Light dies before thy uncreating word, Thy hand, great anarch, lets the curtain fall, and universal darkness buries all. In 1943, when I recited this to a classmate at the Phillips Exeter Academy, he was bewildered. Why did you learn that, he asked. Because, I said, it's bound to be apt one of these days. And so it is today, January 1st, 2006. You are watching original video by truthdig.com. For more information and resources, visit us on the web at www.truthdig.com. You are watching original video by truthdig.com. For more information and resources, visit us on the web at www.truthdig.com. We're here to push this book, and people can buy it on our site through Amazon or go to bookstores and help the sales figures. A fabulous book. And uh, let me begin. Um, well, first of all, it's kind of depressing the way you begin this book. You say you're headed for the exit. I'm and not serious. Oh, you're not serious. Okay. Because I got a little worried. I'm not far behind, you know. And uh, No. My, my exit is headed toward me. Oh. <laughs> I'm not running toward it. But you make the point uh, that you've lived through one-third of the history of this country. And most of the 20th century. Yeah. Three-quarters of the 20th century. Right. And it started out, I don't know, from the book, it sounds like it was a lot more exciting, <laughs> vital, and fun-filled than it is now. I'm now a creationist because of the distance from uh, George Washington to George W. Bush makes a monkey out of Darwin. <laughs> And you've, been, you've seen a lot of scoundrels in your time. You've been in, you know, you've been some through periods where we've been ruled by liars. You've exposed a number of those lies. There's a difference between that and having, uh, and having systemic lying, which is the only way these people know how to govern. The president says, look, look at New Orleans in no time at all. Everything's going to be cleaned up. And uh, I've given orders. And what I told you last time when I was here in uh, whatever square this is, 
It's got a church here, isn't it? It's a cathedral square. I told, what I told you then, I meant. And that's what you're going to get. He was telling the truth. He, they got nothing, and they got nothing the second time around. Everybody knows that about him. There are a few crazies who want to cheer 